It seems that I should unmute. Could I get a, a sign, Geo, that I can start now? I think you should wait a bit. Good morning, everybody, um, until everyone has joined. And I look to my colleague here, and he will give a sign. Okay. Right now, there are 35 people. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll be waiting as a minute, Max. So 60, we wait another minute and then we give it a start. Yes, oh, thank you. Thank you and good morning to everyone. Um, as Danish Chair of the Integrate Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar. Due to the Corona crisis, we have been forced to postpone network activities. The sixth International Integrate Network meeting was planned to take place in Gripsko, north of Copenhagen in Denmark this spring. Instead, we are here today sitting behind our screens. We are sorry not to be able to meet you in the forest and discuss with you. We still think we have many interesting things to show you and we're looking forward to host you here in Denmark. Despite the Corona crisis, it has been important for us to keep the network alive. Thus we took the initiative to arrange today's webinar. Before giving the word to Gil Winkel from EV in Bonn on behalf of the mem uh, network members, I would like to thank Evie for their assistance in planning and arranging today's event. And not least, thank our keynote speakers for your contribution to today's topic. I'll come back to the, to the details of today's topic in my presentation shortly after the introduction. I want you all to have a nice meeting. Um, you from Evie will uh, facilitate the meeting. He will now give uh, of some more practical information about the webinar and so shortly introduce the Integrate Network. You please take over from here. Uh, thank you very much, Mats Jensen, Danish Nature Agency, the chair of the Integrate Network. Good morning also from my side here from Bonn in a very special Integrate uh, event, I have to say. Um, Multiple scales for nature conservation in sustainable forest management, integration and segregation. Um, and the webinar's title today is how to integrate segregation and sustainable forest management tools, scale and processes. I would first like to give those of you that have not already attended the meetings of the European Network Integrate a short overview on what the network is actually doing and what it actually is. And I read here a bit from the founding documents of the network. Um, European Network Integrate promotes and advances forest management approaches for the integration of nature conservation into sustainable forest management at three levels, the decision-making policy level, the level of forest practitioners and managers, and the level of research and academic knowledge. 
And this is done in a way um, that Integrate is an initiative that is driven by country representatives and their topical interests. We have currently 19 European countries participating in the network meetings, and the European Commission is participating as an observer. The network operates um, through changing chairs. Um, you have just seen already as your wake up call in this early morning, or not so early, depending on where and how you work. Um, Mats Jensen presenting the Danish chair, the Danish Nature Agency. Previous chairs have been Germany, uh, the Czech Republic, Poland, now we have Denmark, and upcoming chairs are Switzerland and Spain um, from spring 2021, finally onwards. And the European Forest Institute um, that I'm here, um, where I'm uh, working with, we are facilitating the network currently within the Forest Side project, which has been generously funded by the German IMDA. Well, uh, the topic of today, I think Mats will give a bit more insights also against the specific background coming from the Danish situation in a few minutes, how to integrate segregation and sustainable forest management, tools, scale and processes. It's an interesting topic that might have raised already some questions among the attendants. And I, we really look forward to discussing this with you in a typical way, how we do it in the Integrate Network. Um, today, quite heavily leaning towards science based presentations, and then hopefully with an intense discussion between practitioners, scientists, and policy experts. Just quickly on the schedule, um, we will have first a presentation by Mats celebrating a bit the background in the Danish context and the Danish situation. And then we have Eric Buchwald. Um, he will talk again, um, he will talk about incorporating the 2020 targets data on species and their policy in the selection of sites for conservation forests, the Danish situation and the science behind. Then we have an interesting situation. We had to do a last minute um, change in the, in the plan of the seminar because Joan Payet for some reasons could not access the internet this morning. Um, and Chris van der Kerkhofer, the third speaker, has been combining his and Antoine's presentation into one joint presentation. And I leave it then up to Chris how he then titles this new presentation. But the basic idea is to look into this process, um, forest segregation for conservation, to look into what is happening if we move a formerly managed forest towards segregation. And then we have a very interesting. Uh, um, presentation that's starting with active vandalism. I will read this when I introduce the speakers later by Jakob. Um, <coughs> sorry, move this a bit down. Jakob Heimann Klausen from University of Copenhagen. So we do this um, presentation by scientists, and afterwards we will have a lot of time for a fruitful and hopefully interesting discussion on this interesting topic that's relevant in quite many countries, not only Denmark. But before we do this, um, I would like to introduce also some webinar rules. So first of all, um, the webinar will be recorded and will be available online afterwards. Um, secondly, if you are trying to make yourself visible to the webinar participants and to unmute yourself to ask questions, don't be frustrated. Um, only the speakers and the moderator will be unmuted and visible to all and all other attendants then these will be muted and the videos will be disabled. However, I will come to this in a few seconds. We have the possibility to give you the voice in the discussion. How can I intervene then with this? Um, well, basically, we ask you to use the so-called questions and answers function uh, in the system, Q&A uh, down on your task list, to ask questions or put comments. And please also write who you are, because often we cannot see this. Um, unless you don't want to be, uh, you want to be named, that's also a possibility, then don't do it. But address also whom you wish to respond. We will then gather the questions for all presentations and ask the speakers after the presentations um, to respond to them. And as I said, there is the possibility also to give you directly the floor, uh, especially if you don't understand your questions. However, I hope that you put your questions very clear very understandable. It should not be an incentive now to put them in a complicated way. Well, for more information, please um, look at our webpage, Integrate Network. Well, we will start this with a small interactive exercise and I hand over to my colleague, Jose, who has prepared a very small call for you. 
also to check out your mood on this interesting topic, integration segregation on a Monday morning. So see, please give it a start. What is the best way to transfer a wood production forest into a non-intervention natural forest? Do nothing. Nature will find its way in any case. Actively manage ecological restoration to speed up the process. It depends on the situation. We will give you another five seconds to answer a big question on an early Monday morning. Do we have for uh, Only 40%. We give it a bit more time. Jose? 65%. Last chance for you. Okay, let's see where we are. I have a guess, but I'm not sure. <laughs> let's show the difference. Yeah. That was, of course, the easy answer. It depends on the situation, clearly wins. Uh, however, we have also 23% that write on, that prefer an active approach, active management approach, and a 9% that tend to do nothing. We will repeat this in the very end of the webinar. Uh, let's see if there are more people that are wisely responding that it depends on the situation or if we have to shift the perspectives. Well, with that, um, I'm handing back to Mats who will now introduce the Danish situation and also a bit why this topic for the second or second seminar during the Danish chairmanship. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, um, this is not the way we have planned the Danish chairmanship. Sitting here behind our screen, unable to look you in the face and have good fruitful discussions with you. But as the situation is at the moment, it seems this is the way we can do it. And I hope that we'll have some very good discussions during the day because these discussions are very important for all of us in the network. In the Danish chairmanship, we had planned together with the EFI uh, to have two physical meetings in Denmark. The one meeting took place last year in Rolskov we were looking uh, quite uh, keenly into um, integration aspects of the managed forest. And at this second meeting, we wanted to discuss how we could possibly integrate segregation in sustainable forest management, because that is quite important in a Danish context at the moment. And that is exactly what we want to do at this seminar. Please change. We have been chair for this uh, fine network for a little more than a year at the moment. And for me at least, it seems that the discussions on what the forest can deliver to society is even increasing within the last years. They were high already before, but at the moment we discuss climate, we discuss recreational possibilities, we discuss uh, soil protection, water protection, and many other things but not least biodiversity, uh, biodiversity aspects of forest management and also of forest not managed. It's very important for society in Denmark uh, that uh, biodiversity is getting uh, better opportunities. It seems also that the EU Commission uh, launching the Green Deal has the same uh, uh, aspects of getting wanting uh, the forest to deliver what society asks for them. Therefore, I still hope that the EU Commission find this inter uh, integrate network relevant to follow because we have interesting discussion. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, fruitfully discuss with each other. Please change. They might think, why do we need to discuss segregation in an integration network. In my opinion, uh, it's very important for this network, as you also mentioned here in the, in the introduction, to discuss how to integrate biodiversity aspects in the forest. And many biodiversity experts, at least in Denmark, says that the 
that the biodiversity needs more space and it need, needs more natural dynamic processes. So that is the reason why we want to have this discussion, uh, discussion of these topics today. Please, James. We have in this network been dealing with um, integration aspects in, in many ways. Uh, and for me, it's very important to stress out that this is not a matter of integration or segregation. It's a matter of both. If we need to uh, fulfill the society's needs from the forest, I think we need to look into the whole toolbox of possibilities to fulfill these, uh, these requirements. The company that, that I worked for in Denmark is a publicly owned uh, land manager. And that means, of course, that the, that the decisions whether we should do more of integration or more of segregation or whatever, it's a political decision. Our task is to do whatever we are asked to do in the best possible way. And that is exactly the reason for the discussions today, to get even more knowledge about what we can do with the one or the other. Please change. As we saw in Raw, also last year, we are in Denmark working very much with single elements, microhabitats, uh, whether it's dead wood, the high stumps, or veteran trees. It's very important for us to work with these elements within the integrated forest management. Even in the close to nature forestry, that are the Danish Nature Agency's way of, uh, of uh, stretching out uh, sustainable forest management. We are integrating forest meadows and box and even uh, old growth set aside forest is for us an integrated part of, uh, of the uh, integrated forest management. It seems that it is a matter of scale, of course. When does a part of the forest, uh, when is it big enough to be uh, segregated or when is it a, a, a normally integrated part of the, of the integrated forest management? I think this differs from country to country and there will not be one thinking answer to that question. It's probably due to the size of the forest areas in the, in the country and whatever. Uh, it could be many other reasons for answering that question. Please change. Well, actually, it might not be that very important uh, whether it's uh, 500 hectares or 1,000 hectares. Uh, the most important thing must be that we are asked to to do uh, take out areas uh, to make them untouched uh, to to uh, regain um, natural dynamics to introduce large uh, um, grazing animals within the forest it's uh, it's very much discussed in Denmark at the moment at least not only to to uh, untouch the forest but also introduce new um, uh, dynamics by uh, grazing animals, for instance. At the same time as we must do this as wise as possible, the, uh, it's also for me an opportunity to learn from the untouched forest and the, and the, and the things that are happening there. I think it's very important to study this carefully, to, to take in the good aspects from that in the integrated forest management to gain as much as possible uh, within in the integration. Please change. To do things wisely is probably easier said than done, at least in my point of view. If we had had in Denmark a lot of virgin forest, it might be easier to pick out some of them to be untouched. But this is not the case in Denmark. I think it's maybe, may, maybe the same in many other European countries. But in Denmark, at least, we don't have a lot of forests. The forests are quite small. They are, quite, they are pretty young. Most of them are less than 200 years old. And on top of this, we might not be world champions in having great for, uh, big forests but we are quite good at introducing uh, non-native tree species. 
we have been picking out tree species from all over the world uh, to try them out in a Danish context. So what we are looking at in Denmark is small, young forest consisting of uh, quite a lot of uh, non-native tree species. So this is the task that we are dealing with in Denmark at least. And this is the task that we are asked to, to deal with by some of uh, the politician that is so, so who decides. But it raises a lot of questions on how to do things. In that aspect, we in Denmark want to work very carefully with our stakeholders. We showed you that in the Rolskov event uh, last year as well. It's very important in a Danish context that we get the stakeholders to the table to have fruitful and open discussions on how to do things the best way to get as much as possible uh, out of the, the forest. Also, we have a lot of questions on how to manage actively or passively forest restoration coming from the outpoint that we are dealing with in Denmark, as I told you before. Please change. And dealing with all these questions, I'm very happy that we have, ha we have today four, uh, actually now three keynote speakers who can help us uh, getting started of these uh, discussions. I'm sure, Gil, that you can present these fine uh, keynote speakers a lot better than I can. So I'll hand over the floor to you, uh, Gil, to present uh, the next speaker. Thank you for the word. Thank you, Mats, for, for giving us a nice introduction and at least some of the pictures that help us a bit to, to see what we are missing with a physical meeting not being in Denmark and discussing this as it's quite often done in the network also in the forest. But I think that was a great background and also explaining a bit the, the Danish situation in the context that is, um, that is uh, characterizing the seminar. But at the same time, uh, I can assure you this is a question, as we know, that is also relevant beyond Denmark. Well, um, it was said that I would be the one to introduce better the speakers. Of course, I can do this because I also asked them to send me a bit of information. And I would like to um, continue directly with our first speaker, Eric Buchwald. Um, he, uh, he will talk um, about incorporating um, 2020 targets, data on species and their ecology in the selection of sites for conservation forest. And Eric is a forester and specialized in biodiversity um, protection. He has been working on natural forest protection since the 1990s. And later, he made an industrial PhD in 2015 and 2018. It's quite an impressive book uh, on prioritization of future efforts for Danish biodiversity with a particular regard to the state forests. He was also the Danish representative in the EU um, Mature 2000 context on forest protection for many years. Eric, the floor is yours, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. And I hope Jose can present my slides. Um, and um, please proceed to the next one immediately. So, why are we talking about uh, this, uh, these targets? That's because we have a biodiversity crisis, and that's uh, global and European level, and also, of course, in Denmark. Uh, some things are going better, but in general, a lot of species are doing worse. And we have a long list of threatened species. Um, and that has made the politicians make these political 2020 targets, which have been the basis of the, the Danish work uh, that we should try to stop the decline, reverse the decline. And uh, one of the ways we've been doing that is the efforts for untouched forest and biodiversity forest in Denmark. Next slide, please. So the process has been a very political one for the last five, 10 years in Denmark. Uh, so the government has set up targets in 2016 and the new government in 2019 has enhanced those larger targets. Uh, so we're talking both single tree, uh, deadwood and biotopes at the integration scale in, in normal forestry. Uh, but we are also 
having a clear view from the politicians that we they want us to set aside uh, up to 20,000 hectares of state forests and they also give subsidies for private forests but today I'm talking about the what we're doing in the Danish state forests. So uh, from the scientific view, point of view there's been a lot of debate for many many years about this what's called the SLOSS discussion. Do we have a need for single large or several small uh, reserves or protection sites? And in our view, the discussion scientifically has ended out in it that it's not a loss, it's an and. It's, it's not or, it's and. So we need both types of protection at the landscape scale. And uh, politicians in Denmark have also said that when we do this work, we should do it science-based, and that's probably a very good idea. So I have been one of the key uh, workers to try to get it into systematic conservation planning, how to find these new political things, uh, sites. So next slide, please. So what is systematic conservation planning? Well, you need a lot of data, you need decision support tools to combine those data into a priorities. And the spatial priorities can lead into zoning, different protection levels, or even protected area networks. And at general, like in forestry, management plans will be a very important tool to make things happen and make, give the priorities the full effect. So in my industrial PhD, I used this systematic approach using Mark Sandwell's zones, which is one of the decision support tools. And the process was also uh, helped by a lot of university experts on biodiversity, delivering their priorities based on expert judgment and on a large scale biodiversity mapping of Denmark, which has been produced as GIS and reports and using proxies for structures of forests and landscape, but also uh, species data on both threatened species and other species. I put in a few links uh, if somebody wants to go further. Next slide, please. So protected and non-protected, that could be protection, but we might also have different types of protection. And in Mark Sand, that's called zoning. So, and that's because the many different species, they, they need to have different needs. So that's biodiversity. They don't need the same all the way. And the other reason is that money could be a, a, a issue. So less than full protection of forest may be sufficient for the species to thrive. And of course it's cheaper in money. So in the Mark Sand process, uh, we set up Forest zones, normal forestry with no extra protection. We all have a basal level of protection in all our state forests, of course, but so no extra protection from that. Then we had some species needing more deadwood of conifers or other conifer uh, things. So we say, okay, in conifer forestry, which is usually non native in Denmark, there might be some possibilities for extra protection, deadwood, et cetera, et cetera. The third zone we took out was that a lot of species are light dependent uh, and like the glades in the forest or sunlit trees. So active conservation management in order to give these or other species with specific needs, um, their needs, the, that was zone three. While the last zone four was sort of the non or minimum intervention reserve type of, of uh, forest where some species really like that or need that specifically. And uh, that then gives the cost of 100%. But even the zone three active conservation can be very costly. So the, there were set in the Mark Sands several uh, cost estimates variable. Next slide, please. So a lot of species data is necessary for this uh, Mark Sand to run and uh, some uh, cost estimates of each forest polygon, which is included. And uh, then the Mark Sand uses complementarity, uh, meaning that each, we sh you shouldn't take all the hotspots where all the many species are. You need to 
cover every species involved, every priority or threatened species. And we set a target to protect each species at least five times matching its preferences. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, here's an overview, which I won't go in details with, but all the 2000 species we were grouped in, what kind of ecological preference do they have? Is it conifers, deciduous? Do they be like deadwood or other things? Saprosilic in this slide means deadwood loving. Um, so this is input for the Mark San analysis and this is based on databases and expert consultation. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So if you show it on a map, this is a, a, a red, a yellow and a white polygon, which are all our forests. So this is state forest areas. And in each of these polygons, you show see a lot of colored dots. So each dot will be species um, data. And the uh, colors of both the forest polygons and the dots show uh, preferences of species. So if you have a lot of uh, green dots, uh, you might get a green polygon. If you have a lot of white dots, you might end up with a white polygon. The Mark Shan says to get the cheapest target achievement, it based on the dots chooses which color, meaning which kind of protection each for it should have. So in this case, which is Ralston, where we were in the autumn, the red one will be for zone four needing more untouched forest. The yellow one would be more active protection needed. And the white one would be normal forestry operations would be good enough to keep these species happy, which are there. Next slide, please. So the outcome can be shown on a landscape scale map here on the right, we have North Zealand. You get a lot of forests. Uh, every polygon uh, is a state forest area. And many of them are white, but also many of them have colors showing the different preferences. And in New Zealand, a lot of the forests have so many threatened species that you need some kind of protection. While in Western Denmark, most forests will be white, meaning that you can carry on nor more or less normal uh, integrated forestry. But in New Zealand, you would need to think a lot about this would be a good place to put extra protection. So there's a very high degree of overlap between these Mark Sand based forest for protection and the expert based recommendations. But the latter only recommended untouched as protection type. So in my view, the spatial systematic conservation planning, this does give some extra uh, input to choose the right polygons. Next slide, please. So we have these political decisions and they were resulted in, in um, 13,800 hectares of forest reserves, which were designated in 2018 based on the PhD results and the university recommendations. And uh, in December, 2019, the politicians wanted even more, uh, 6,000 hectares, even more of untouched forest and they wanted a quicker stop for the commercial, commercial forestry. So that should stop immediately in all designations so that um, we get quicker untouched status. Earlier we had, we're talking about 10 to 50 year transition period. Next slide, please. So which take home messages could we have? Well, most species uh, in the Mark Sand analysis turned out to be able to be helped by integration, uh, but some species need segregation because they need specific uh, untouched uh, status um, uh, and that kind of protection, which is not very easy to combine with, with forestry. And the science can show some options and solutions, but note that it's people and politics that make things happen. We have had a very high involvement of, of people and lobbyists and uh, NGOs and politicians to decide these things. Without that, nothing would have happened. So remember to involve people and science. I think that was the last slide, but you can change to my acknowledgements, please. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for giving us a deep insight into the Danish situation, also the science and uh, decision making in this field of integration segregation in the context of the Danish uh, public forests. We will now uh, directly move on uh, to the next presentation, but before I do so, I would really like to invite all of you to put uh, questions and answers to the speakers. Um, I think I'm the only one who cannot do it directly in the question and answer function, so I have to do it on this uh, sheet here. But all the others, please do it, and that makes it easier also for us to directly start with the discussion afterwards. Our next speaker would have been Jean Payet, but it is actually Chris van der Kerkhove. Uh, Chris is um, a forest ecology researcher. Hello, Chris. <laughs> at the Flemish uh, Research Institute of Nature and Forests in Belgium. His research focuses on conservation issues in forests uh, and the main research topic he and his team have been working on in the last 20 years is the monitoring of dynamics and biodiversity in strict forest research. As I said, Chris has done an entirely brave job this morning of combining his presentation together with the presentation of the second keynote speaker, Jean Payet. Jean? unfortunately cannot join us this morning because of technical challenges. Um, he's a research engineer at the French Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and the Environment, in Rain, previously INRA, many might still know this name, currently working um, in Grenoble, beautiful Grenoble. And his research interests comprise the link between biodiversity, forest management, and the validation of biodiversity indicators. This is a special interest in forest structures such as tree-related microorganisms. Chris, I'm really curious about the title of your presentation now and, and about the joint work, and it's really great of you to do this. Very much look forward to your presentation. And as we agreed, of course, you have more time than 10 minutes to now present the joint wisdom of Jan and you. Okay, thank you, Georg. Um, I will try to share my screen now with you. I have combined both presentations to one presentation and I hope this will work. Uh, let's see. Do you all see my screen? Forest segregation for conservation? Yes. I don't get any reaction, so I, I guess everything is yes. going well. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, I have uh, stitched together my presentation with this of uh, Yuan, and I have made uh, one presentation uh, giving some uh, scientific background, but also some practical experiences with uh, setting aside forests uh, for conservation mainly. Um, let's see. Uh, so if we're talking about uh, conservation of, of uh, forests, uh, the average reaction of most people is uh, thinking about uh, protecting the last remnants of uh, old growth in Europe. And there's been some publications on uh, what do we still have <coughs> considering old growth and, and old forests in Europe. That's only a very small uh, share of the total forest area, but even there, there are some conservation gaps. Uh, but if we consider uh, Northwestern Europe, of course, we have very little and many of these old growth sites uh, are already quite protected. What we will be focusing on in the future, uh, mostly in Northwestern Europe, will be to set aside uh, managed forests uh, as a, a surrogate, let's say, for primary forests uh, in the idea that after a shorter or longer while, we will also protect uh, valuable uh, conservation goals in our forest by uh, setting aside previously managed forests. And there's quite some, uh, some potential there. Uh, this is some figures from France, from uh, Yuan, showing that about 3% of all forests in France haven't been harvested over the last 50 years. So there is already some development of uh, set aside areas not always deliberately set aside, but nowadays more and more areas are actively set aside as a protection goal. Question is whether this reaches uh, the goals of conservation by doing nothing. And to find out, we will check uh, some, some aspects of it. So I've moved one of my slides in, in front to, to set the scene a little bit. Um, if we look at uh, forests, all over Europe, uh, or, or natural forests, uh, 
you could say that they have this uh, natural cycle of development. And what we have been doing uh, in Europe all over for many centuries is uh, make a shortcut in this natural uh, cycle. Uh, we have uh, removed the second half of the natural cycle in forests and at the same time all also taken away the biodiversity that is linked to this uh, part. And what we try to do now with conservation efforts is to restore partly this uh, second part of the, of the cycle. And that can be done both in integrative and segregative ways. So integrative uh, by leaving dead wood and uh, habitat trees uh, in the managed forest, uh, but also segregative is then to to set aside larger areas, as it was said before, it's uh, mainly a question of, of scale, setting aside uh, uh, substantial areas of uh, forest and not intervening anymore, leaving it to natural developments. In the idea that uh, by recreating the structures of a natural forest, of, of the late successional phases of a natural forest, uh, also the um, associated species will follow. And indeed, if we look at the unmanaged forest compared to managed, uh, these are unmanaged forests, but previously managed. So left, uh, left alone for, for a few decades or several decades, we can see indeed that the uh, share of large living trees is definitely higher. Uh, also, and especially on deadwood, we see uh, big differences. Uh, you can see large amounts of uh, deadwood in these unmanaged forests. Uh, for snags, for instance, uh, this number it can be eight times higher than for the managed forests that were in, in the study of Yuan. Uh, not only these typical elements that have been looked for for a long time are there, but also uh, a, a new aspect of this uh, late successional forest conservation is the the conservation of tree related microhabitats. So trees that contain uh, cavities that have uh, leisures or uh, have a, a large uh, density of epiphytes on their stems uh, have a high conservation value. And then we see that in these unmanaged forests, not only the density, but also the diversity of these elements is higher. Uh, we also have some figures on how fast these elements develop, especially for deadwood. This has been uh, studied quite in detail. And we can say that uh, it takes about 50 to 100 years for an average managed forest to reach amounts of deadwood that are found in, uh, in a natural unmanaged forest. So it's a slow process. It takes its time. <clears throat> but slowly but surely, uh, these amounts of deadwood are building up. The same goes for the microhabitats. Uh, it may take some longer time for certain uh, elements to develop, but if you look uh, at woodpecker cavities, for instance, we see a much higher amount of uh, uh, cavities in these um, uh, unmanaged forests after 50 years of uh, non, non intervention. This number of uh, woodpecker cavities can be six times higher than in an average. Uh, managed forest. A uh, big question is, of course, uh, we can create structures for species, but do the species follow? And is it working? Um, for some species, uh, having this integrative approach uh, within the managed forest will not be enough. There are certain species like this uh, white backed woodpecker that uh, needs. Uh, amounts of deadwood of uh, over 50 cubic meters and one breeding pair needs 50 hectares. So if you want to have a, a, a lively population or a viable population of this woodpecker species, you need, really need large areas of undisturbed forest. Also, there is a coloni colonization credit to be paid, which means that you may create uh, habitat uh, conditions for a species, but the species still needs uh, to have the possibility to recolonize it. And that will depend a lot on the dispersal possibilities of certain species. There are uh, beetle species that can travel only 50 to 100 meters away from where they are born. 
So you will need these structures in the immediate uh, surroundings. It will not be able to colonize uh, a site that is uh, 20 kilometers away. Uh, in this context, of course, also spatial structure of these satellites is crucial. Will species be able to move from one protected area to another? And there's this uh, uh, schematic uh, uh, representation there uh, in the low corner of the, of the slide showing how a, a, a viable uh, complex of uh, old growth elements should be organized in the landscape and then it's very important to show that also the white area with the red dots, which is the, the integrative um, share, is as important as the set-aside areas if you want to have a system that works. Um, and is it working? Yes, it is. Uh, we can see results for certain uh, species groups. Of course, it's very uh, dependent on the Taxa, uh, this figure shows uh, bars on the left means that there is a higher uh, species richness in the unmanaged forest compared to the managed forest. So overall, the first uh, bar shows that there is a, uh, a slight but significant higher species richness in the unmanaged forest compared to the managed one. But there are some exceptions, for instance, for vascular plants, uh, there was a some uh, indications that the species richness may be lower in the, manage, in the unmanaged forest compared to managed forest. Same goes for certain uh, species of non sapoxylic beetles, light demanding uh, thermophilic species that are uh, not benefiting from doing nothing. Now, if we go to uh, our Belgian situation, I will not uh, overwhelm you with figures, but mainly focus on how uh, our experiences have been over the last 20 years with uh, uh, installing strict forest reserves in formerly managed forests. Um, we have seen some reservation towards these reserves, not necessarily from the, from the public, because most people are quite uh, positive about setting aside forests. Uh, wilderness is popular. People, especially the city people, are uh, associating forests with recreation and quietness. So for them, harvesters and clear-cut areas are more considered as disturbing or even upsetting them. So having areas with no management is uh, to a, a wider public, especially city people, uh, considered a very positive development. Al although we should say that people in the countryside who also know that the forest is important uh, as, a, as a form of resource uh, are not always that uh, enthusiastic about it. How about forest managers? For some forest managers, this uh, setting aside can be seen as a motion of distrust towards their management. Have we done uh, our job so badly that they are taking away the forest from us? I must say in, in, in Belgium, especially in Flanders, we didn't have uh, this uh, bad experience with ma managers. Most forest managers are quite positive about uh, having a strict reserve in their, in their area. They see it as a, a, a good test, as a test areas, as blanks to compare their forest management with areas where nothing is done and to see what, what, what is their added value or their influence on the forest. So they are mostly interested and positive about it. We did have more reservation from uh, certain people in conservation who have uh, quite a certain distrust towards uh, this uh, new situation that they don't know and they uh, have a little uh, worry, have, have quite some worries about what will happen and whether we will not uh, lose more species than we gain. Um, this is mainly fed by the fact that conservation management or conservation in, in uh, our part of the world uh, has been very much in a tradition, has been done very much in a tradition of predetermination and control. There's a, they have very specific uh, vegetation types or uh, goals that they are managing uh, a nature area for. And uh, so this predetermination 
predetermination is very strong. And if you start to do nothing, then there's this fear of the dark, fear of the unknown that is uh, coming up. Now, maybe this uh, fear is not always uh, unjustified. If you look at this uh, theoretical figure from Scherzinger, you can see that if we uh, let the forest go unmanaged, then for uh, fauna, uh, this may have a positive effect. But for flora, we could see that there's this dip we have to go through, a dark phase, before the forest gets more mixed and the species can uh, redevelop. Uh, we have tested this in, this in, in Belgium uh, in a specific, specific reserves. We had uh, four reserves that we studied uh, on uh, species richness of forest plants. And then we see indeed that there's a loss of species richness over a period of 10, 10 to 15 years. Uh, however, if we look to the typical forest species of closed canopy forests, uh, these anemones and other uh, uh, early spring flowers, for instance, uh, there's no loss of species. Uh, the species loss is especially in the species group of gaps and uh, species that also occur in the open countryside. So uh, to some, this means that uh, we could consider this as a less is more story. Indeed, even we could see that uh, some of these typical forest species increased over time in coverage as they don't had, didn't have to compete anymore with uh, uh, spe disturbance related species. And what about other species groups? If you look at uh, birds or beetles or fungi, we see in Belgium an overall improvement uh, for these late successional species. They are increasing, they are doing better than 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so the integration approach, which is also there in, in Belgium, uh, works. However, these reserves show to be very important as outposts for recolonization of the more demanding species. So the the, the species that demand high amounts of dead wood uh, or are very specific in their habitat are first noticed, are first colonizing these reserves where there's this high density of uh, suitable habitats, build up a viable population there and then can spread out to the rest of the forest later on. Um, Something on these slow processes. Indeed, we also saw this in the in reality. Uh, some of our reserves uh, consist of uh, trees of 80 years old. Well, after 20 years, there's very little happening, but things are moving slowly. Uh, on the other hand, we also had a reserve uh, with beaches of uh, 180 years old at the moment of uh, setting aside, and there in 20, 30 years, we've reached. Uh, amounts of dead wood and structure that are very comparable to uh, a natural beach forest. So, of course, the starting situation will, de will, will decide or will uh, have a strong influence on the, 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 the speed of the development. And that makes it very tempting to have some first little tiny little interventions before setting uh, forest aside to give it some kind of a kickstart, let's say. Um, this is a, especially the case when you look at uh, leaving uh, spruce or pine uh, stands for natural development. Uh, do you just let them go or do you uh, intervene first? Uh, our experience is if you just let them go, it will develop in the right way in, the, in, a, in a mixed forest, of course. Uh, it will depend a lot whether there are phytosanitary risks to the surrounding forests. There are examples from uh, Black Forest or Bayerische Wald where they had spruce stands, even age spruce stands, left unmanaged and after a few decades they developed to a very interesting and mixed, uh, uh, very structure, structured uh, forest stands with a high amount of deadwood and a very high biodiversity. Of course, this depends a lot whether you can let bark beetle outbreaks just develop or uh, whether you have to intervene there to pr protect uh, surrounding forest stands. 
What about potentially invasive species? Sometimes we have in our reserves also uh, populations of uh, species like black cherry and red oak that can be invasive in some stands. There, our experience is that uh, the, the risk is very context dependent, the risk of them being invasive and uh, overtaking the forest. Uh, we have a forest reserves with black cherry uh, when they are very well structured that this black cherry just merges in into the, the mixture and is not uh, overtaking or dominating. The same with red oak there, it will be very much dependent on the soil conditions, uh, whether you, uh, it will be, become dominant or not. Um, another question, and that will also come in the next presentation, do, don't we need to speed up things a little bit I think it's always an option to do so if you, if you are a bit impatient. But I think it's important that, we have, that you set a time limit to it. Otherwise, you will continue to uh, have... There's always a good reason to, to intervene and to, to uh, have little uh, amendments to, to the development, to have it more the way you would like it. So in, in our case, we have this uh, time limit of five years where when a site is uh, decided to be set aside, there's a five limit, five year time limit that you can still do some uh, minor interventions to speed up uh, the development. Uh, that can be open up the canopy, assisted migration, so introducing some missing species uh, or vandalized trees, as we will see. Uh, to my opinion, in the end, nature will also do so. It just takes a little more time. So uh, it's a question of, uh, of, of, of uh, patience and of faith. And then finally, uh, if I would have 25 or 20,000 hectares to select the discussion on sloths or slas, I think uh, we should go for the single large and several small uh, areas as it was also decided for Denmark already. The large areas there, I think their focus should be on rewilding. Uh, so wilderness species, no explicit expectations for highly demanding species. Uh, nature may surprise us there. There we can focus on, on, on biomass, on large quantities of, uh, of saproxylic species, not necessarily on the very highly demanding species. In smaller areas, you can really focus on these relic species and high quality uh, demanding species. That's kind of cherry picking where you choose the best areas uh, to protect. Uh, ancient woodland sites will be selected there. Areas with a long continuity of old growth characteristics uh, should be selected there. Indicator species of relic sites. And uh, there's also the, the, the advice not to include ancient wood pastures and other hotspots for thermophilic species, because in that case, you might, up, uh, ending, might end up with uh, losing a lot of species uh, without gaining uh, much interesting new species. So that's uh, mostly also the approach that has been followed, I think, in the, the thinking of uh, the Danish program now. So I have nothing, nothing uh, new to add to this. Uh, only can I say, can it be done? Yes, we can do it. Uh, there's some examples of this uh, theoretical program uh, being realized in the field. This is in Belgium, in the Zonian forest, a large uh, protected area in green with some patches of set aside in the yellow matrix of integrated uh, forest management and, and uh, habitat trees in there also. There's another example here from uh, France. So it can be done and it can be uh, satisfying both to conservationists and foresters. And that's it for me. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. And I don't know who to thank now most. Thanks to John also for having preparing this, but I really have to thank you. I'm very impressed uh, how you managed this in the early morning hours to make this a coherent and very interesting presentation. We got already quite some questions for you, and I would like to ask those good questions. Be prepared for getting live.
so if you are on your couch, uh, make sure that you are after the next presentation prepared for being visible for the webinar participants. We might ask some of you to directly ask the questions. We now move directly on before we go into questions and answers to the last speakers, who has a very uh, interesting title. Uh, it's Jakob Heilmann Clausen. He is an associate professor at the Center for, for Macroecology, Evolution and Climate at the University of Copenhagen. Um, he focuses also on forest biodiversity and how it is impacted by management or other habitat conditions um, at the individual tree um, up to the landscape scale. And here you can see yourself the title of this talk. Jakob, we look forward to your vandalism story. Thank you. Um, I hope you can see my screen and hear me. Yes. Super. Okay, then I'll just get started. I have been presented, so uh, let's look at the, the contents, whether it's possible to speed up the process, whether we are, if we are impatient or, or if some species are on the limit to go extinct because of lack of habitats. So, um, so if you look at the, the history of forest in Northwestern Europe, at least, it's been a, a, a gradual loss of wild, uh, wilderness and, and, and natural habitats uh, due to, to many different things, uh, starting with early in the, in the medieval times and even earlier with the loss of natural graces. Um, and uh, of course, they, most of the natural graces was replaced by, uh, uh, by livestock grazing. Um, and that for a very long time made many forests more open than they would, or, or more landscapes actually more open than they would have been, uh, even with the natural grazing regimes. Uh, later on, there was a loss of uh, veteran trees and dead wood uh, due to uh, human use uh, in the remaining forest. And more recently, we have seen a loss of wetlands in the forest, at least in a country like Denmark, where the, the terrain is, is naturally allowing for many depressions. Uh, these have been drained and, and, and transformed into more productive lanes. Uh, and, and, and in some countries like Denmark, the, 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 the grazing animals, uh, the, even the, the, uh, the, the livestock was uh, taken out of the forest 200 years ago. So, so since then we have lost glades and transitions. And we now see that some of these light demanding species that are often associated with forest edges or, or forest uh, meadows are the most uh, declining like butterflies and certain uh, saprocylic beetles that are associated with light open conditions. Uh, so that's what we have lost and of course uh, when, when we design new reserves we want to have these things back in order to to conserve this, the biodiversity that are naturally associated with species and which are not thriving in the managed forest. And uh, in my presentation, I will only, only focus on ways to, to maybe improve the situation for deadwood, veteran trees and glades. So the whole is, is part of what we in Denmark called the Beast Forest Project. It has a longer title that I'll not come with here, um, but it's a, it's a, a project to give, give evidence on management of forest biodiversity. It's a, it's a project that is going to be finalized this year, uh, but there's of course still a lot of things to do with all the data we have, uh, have collected. And it's in the partnership with the Danish State Forest. Um, and it has three components. It has an experimental study, which I will uh, talk about today. There's also what we call a gradient study where we look at the existing stands for different management histories. Uh, and for those that are curious, we have two papers down here you can look at uh, on, on some of the preliminary results. And then uh, there's a goal in the project to make a lot of outreach uh, during symposia workshops. And uh, just, re uh, just now I'm really struggling with, uh, with uh, finalizing a handbook for managers and how to handle biodiversity in managed forest. Um, and when we zoom in on the experimental part, uh, if we haven't been in, in the corona situation, you would have been able to see uh, the experiments in Klipskow. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case. I will only show it on the screen. But we have this basal design that we have selected uh, five stands of 10 hectares in total and divided it into to uh, experimental part uh, and two control parts. So, so, the, so the experimental stand is five hectares and the control stands 
one is managed in a kind of traditional uh, sh slow shelter wood conversion way and the other one is unmanaged um, and, and they are smaller uh, and we're talking about uh, uh, stains that are entering the, the, the early phases of the, of the shelter wood conversion so, so they're around 100 years old um, and belonging to the habitat directive types for those that are interested the, the beach on wool to more soils. And within the experimental stains, we have uh, conducted uh, uh, several different treatments. Um, first of all, we have on the single tree level made tree holes, uh, made ring barking, and burned some trees on the base, not to kill them, but to, to make damage to the living trees uh, in order to make fungi and insects uh, be able to invade the, the healthy beech trees. And then on the larger scale, we have created the canopy gaps. Uh, and in each stand, there's uh, one with and one without dead wood uh, being, uh, so the, the trees that were uh, taking down were basically left on the stand. And then actually there's one more treatment that is the, the simply felled trees with a, a high stump, a, a one, one meter 50 more or less a uh, high stump. So that's the, the, the fourth state uh, treatment on the, on the tree level and was also carried out in the gaps. So in, in, and this was then repeated in all of the, the five stains. So we have replicates. And uh, we already, we are still working. It, it, it's it's uh, only the, the treatments were made in 2014 to 15 and over the winter. Uh, and uh, it's obvious that some of the most interesting responses are yet to come. And we hope to be able to, to, to follow up on that. Uh, but we already have some results. Uh, first of all, we have, uh, for the bird populations, and that this is not only for the experimental stains, but for the for the whole stain, including the control stains, where we had quite a considerable increase in in, in breeding bird numbers, uh, with around 38 percent, uh, 38 percent, with the uh, with some some species like uh, the I can't I'm not so good with the English uh, bird names, but uh, we have the the hollow breeding. Uh, a wood dove, I think is the name, that is a, a, a cavity breeder. And, and, and some of the other species down here are also typical forest species and some of them cavity breeders. And they are, some of them really responded positively to, to, to the treatment with, with up to a five to six doubling of populations. And no bird species were, went less common. But it's still interesting to compare it with, uh, this is the data from what we call the, the gradient study where we looked at, at the at the stands with different management histories, and we can still see if we um, if we look at the at at the the numbers, they are still down in in, in low, well below the unmanaged stands that has high much higher number of breeding birds per per ten hectares. When we zoom a little bit in on, and look at the, on the plants, um, here we have the herbs to the left and. Uh, bryophytes, ground living bryophytes to the right. And uh, that's interesting here to see that, that uh, they actually show opposite trends in the gaps with that wood. And, and well, the, 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 the response is, is, is the same direction, but it's stronger for the gaps, with, for the gaps without that wood. And where we can see there's a, a quite considerable increase in, in number of herb species per, per plot. Uh, but the bryophytes are actually declining just slightly. So, so it is interesting to see that we, when, when we make these canopy gaps, we are really making it favorable for the herbs, which is not surprising, but that is, in, on the other hand, makes a new shadow layer. So in, in the closed canopy, we have the, the, the canopy uh, cover making shadow for the herbs. Then when we open it up, uh, we, we make light for the herbs, but then they are shattering the, the bryophytes. So, they, so we see a small decline. So sometimes a response for one group is negative for the other, but I would say that this is only interesting in, in, in not in a conservation perspective so much, but in, a, in, in understanding how are forest uh, ecosystems responding to disturbance. And, and finally, some results on the tree level, uh, tree level uh, treatments on uh, this is a complex figure with fungi and beetles. Um, and we also have the relative cost per tree. So the cheapest is the felled tree below. That's uh, the easiest treatment to make. And, and you can see that the, the, 
cutting tree holes due to the labor cost is, is, is more complicated to do. It takes longer time to, to make such a, a tree hole. When you look at the fungal and the beetle, beetle species uh, recorded, uh, of course, after these uh, only three years after the treatment, uh, this felled trees have a lot of species and also many species that are, that are really favoring these ha habitats uh, based on indicator species analysis. But it's interesting to see also that the, the tree holes and the basal burning already after a few years are actually, act, actually attracting specific species that really favors those. And that's including this Copenopsis angulatus, which is uh, a species that was not found in Denmark for 10 years before we, we did the experiment, but is associated with burned wood. Uh, so, so even this kind of species are was favored in the short term. Um, and we can also zoom in on the beetles and look at this uh, red-listed Milesis bupristoides, a small wood wood living beetle, uh, which was one of those that showed the most uh, characteristic response to the treatment. You can see that it was really favored by the cavity trees. Um, uh, but was also found on some of the high stumps and on the burnt trees, but, but not on any of the ring barked or unmanaged control trees. And we have the same for a slightly more common species that is not, it, uh, we just had a revision of the, of the Danish red list, so it was red listed before, but not anymore. It has a, also a positive response, but it's, it was also found on some of the control and ring bark trees. So it seems to be less specific uh, in its response to treatment. So um, to take the short term conclusions, we can see that uh, we can actually quite quickly uh, change the, the forest structure if, the, if, if what we have is a, a managed stand. It's easy to, uh, to create uh, gaps and in the same uh, event, create some dead wood uh, with this increasing biodiversity and uh, with urbanization or Active vandalism is, is also a tool that can be used to promote threatened species. And I mean, it's, it's a matter of temperament to some degree that whether we want to speed up that process, but I, because I'm, I'm entirely agreeing with Chris that if we're just patient, uh, these structures and, and habitats will come back. But I think sometimes we also have to consider that the species might be less patient. So we have the risk that some species will disappear from, from landscape, especially if there's very little habitat left, if we don't do something active. So this is our tools that can be, be used. And with these words, I just say thank you for your attention and, and also thank my project partners. So that was all from me at the moment. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Jakob, for the talk on vandalism and its good sides. Um, I would like to open up the discussion and I would like to warn two colleagues that they will be come live very soon, which is Daniel Newton and Thomas Crazier. But uh, while you are connecting and to put your questions, I will read two questions, comments, and then um, please note down in case the panelists, you want to respond to that. The first one is just a comment to Max Jensen by Vivian Christ Johansson, I believe from Copenhagen University, that approximately 50% of the course, uh, current forest area in Denmark is established since the 1950s. There's an interesting context here. Um, and then I have a second question that I would like to read, um, if I find it now, because many questions are coming in uh, at this moment. It's a question by Jan Lee, and uh, the question is, many thanks for interesting presentation. Um, especially to the Danish colleagues regarding involving organization and people. Can you share a bit experiences how the mapping of stakeholders was done in this project? I think it's to Eric, but it refers to the broader question to me, how stakeholders were involved in the Danish uh, process that you have been introducing. Why you are, do you want to quickly respond to the second question and then we go live, I think first with Daniel and then with Thomas. Should I reply now? Yes. Okay. So, so the involvement of stakeholders in Denmark has been in many uh, different ways. Some stakeholders have been very active as lobbyists for the politicians and thereby being very well known from media and others. And that goes for quite a few of the scientists, but also some of our main conservation NGOs, uh, so 
some of the people involved are very well known and that's easy to identify those, but we were, we set up, um, what would you call it, gui guidance groups, uh, teams uh, that we identified uh, persons from the media and science who are very knowledgeable about these things. They were invited to participate in, in groups which could advise on how to proceed forward. And for each uh, designated uh, forest where we either have uh, unmanaged as the goal, as untouched forest as goal or active protection management as goal, we draw up management plans and for the management plan process, we invite uh, local and regional NGOs and uh, the people of the local landscape to join in, in um, consultations and we made uh, forest walks and we made local media announcements about the coming, upcoming plans and the drafts of the management plans are going into public hearings so we have several levels of stakeholder involvement in the in the process. I, I hope that answers. Uh, the, we also, in general, for all our state forests, which are, are split up in twenty about twenty regions, every region has a stakeholder involvement team uh, with representatives of of local and regional NGOs, uh, sports people. Uh, people who ride with horses in the forest, whatever interests, cultural interests, we invite uh, a broad scale approach to uh, advise us on how to manage the forest because we see the state forest as the people's forest. Thank you, Eric. And, and actually I do see no sign from Max that he also wants to respond to that as well. So he's happy with the response, uh, I believe. Then I would directly uh, go live to Daniel, you see there. With this interesting question, I think we're passing Chris. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for letting me ask this question. I had a question for Chris, uh, but I think the Danish colleagues could reply to it as well. Um, okay, um, I'm Daniel Knighton, working for DG Environment from the European Commission, and originally directed to Chris was. How did you overcome this distrust from the forest managers on how that saw the push for uh, unmanaged forests to increase uh, biodiversity as an attack on their work? Because, um, of course, we see similar debates on the European level. Well, I, I can say in, in our experience, it was not so much of a problem because uh, most of our foresters have been trained and learned at university already that it is important to have also these strict reserves, not necessarily from a biodiversity point of view, but more from a scientific uh, point of view as, as blanks where you could study natural dynamics and compare it of, with what you are doing in your managed forests. Um, and I think as long as they, these strict reserves don't uh, take up a too large part of their forest, uh, most foresters are quite okay with it uh, to have like a 50 hectares uh, strict reserve in their area. It, they are also, uh, I think the large majority of, of them are also very interested in what is happening there and, and to see how it develops. Uh, so. From, from that side, we had very little uh, uh, distrust or lack of appreciation. Uh, we, I, I experienced more uh, distrust from uh, traditional conservationists who had a big problem with the fact that we will leave forests to themselves and they mainly focused on the species that may be lost uh, by doing so and not considering the species that may be gained. Uh, of course, because they really knew which species would get into trouble and the other species that uh, will gain are, are much less known to, to, to them. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder, Danish colleagues, do you want to add to this because you were also shortly addressed? No, this is not the case. Then I would suggest we move on to Thomas Kreich. Uh, is he there? Mm -hmm. Great, uh, and I'm very happy because he's also a former integrator. 
Yeah. Good morning, Thomas. You put two questions in the that you qualified perfectly for live connection. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I had two questions uh, which are uh, interconnect, uh, interconnected, in fact. And uh, first of them, uh, uh, both of them uh, concerns uh, criteria uh, based on which you can uh, select uh, for a stance uh, for setting them uh, aside. And I refer uh, especially to a specific situation in the Czech Republic at the moment, because uh, as you may know, uh, we are facing uh, a historical outbreak of uh, bark beetle and there is many uh, forest stands uh, which are in fact, um, uh, which are damaged by, 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 by bark beetle, but uh, in fact dry. And uh, the question is uh, whether it's good uh, starting point uh, for setting uh, these forests aside because uh, there is quite a um, uh, uh, broad discussion at the moment uh, uh, across the, the forest sector with uh, nature protection uh, specialists uh, uh, whether to set aside part of uh, this forest uh, and uh, there are of course some risks for um, uh, visitors of the forest, risk for forest workers, but at the same time uh, it could help uh, also the situation on the market uh, with, with timber because uh, market uh, in um, raw timber uh, broke down and uh, uh, leaving some wood for example in the forest could help uh, this situation. So at the same time, uh, you could uh, help the market at, uh, and also help uh, biodiversity. So many questions uh, around this. And um, uh, especially I'm interested uh, in um, uh, the questions whether it's um, uh, really desirable to, to set aside uh, spruce uh, stands uh, uh, which are outside their nature range. So these were my questions. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I think Chris, you will first uh, address. Do you want to respond first? Yeah, well, I can only speak from what I've seen in other countries because uh, in, in Flanders, at least, in the northern part of Belgium, the, the spruce outbreak is not that much of a, a, a situation because we have very little uh, spruce plantations. However, I do know uh, from examples in, in Germany where they have indeed uh, set aside spruce uh, stands that are outside of their natural range, especially like in the in the Bayerische Wald uh, uh, National Park. And there they see very interesting developments if they leave them unmanaged. Of course, uh, in the context of uh, uh, phytosanitary uh, risks, uh, there, there's it's important to, to, to take that in, in, into consideration. I know that in the Bayerische Wald, they have like a buffer zone of, I think, two kilometers where they still remove the trees to, to uh, prevent uh, a further outbreak. So I'm not so sure uh, if, if, there's, if, if the phytosanitary reasons are not an issue, of course, then it's an interesting case because uh, I've seen very nice forests developing from a previous uh, spruce plantation within uh, two or three decades into a very interesting mixed forest. But of course, uh, you should also consider what is uh, the risk to the, to the surrounding forests, of course. Thank you. I don't know if that's a, a good answer to your question. I think Thomas is smiling. At least, any more uh, answers to these questions? Jakob. I see Jakob. Jakob, I think the floor is yours. Hopefully, at least. Okay, I just have to unmute myself, and for some reason, the, yes, I, I think with in Denmark uh, we have quite many well spruces at the borderline to be native. So, so quite many of the the the, the new forest reserves we will have are, are spruce forest, and I, I think in, in in many of these cases there, uh, well. In some cases, you start to have biodiversity associated with, with these forests. In other cases, you don't. And in, 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 in many cases, the, 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 the spruce forests, at least in Denmark, are planted on, on former open lands. So in, in these cases, uh, probably some of the, the bigger natural qualities are uh, more 
uh, connected to open lands than to, to the forest as such. Uh, and I think for such areas, it, it might be fine to see the, the spruce dying and, and then restore some uh, management uh, in, in the long run that can maintain, maintain a mix of, of forest and open land. And I think in, in most cases you will see after a, some kind of disturbance, whether it's a windstorm or a bark beetle attack, you will see native local tree species, deciduous trees uh, re regenerating uh, by, them, by themselves. So in some cases, the transition to something more natural is, is coming straight forward. And you should always build on kind of the local biodiversity values in the area. Thank you very much. Uh, we have to move on and there are many, many questions now coming in. Uh, people are really waking up. Seems to be an interesting discussion. I would like to read two questions, one by uh, Dries, I have to read the full name soon, and another one by Christoph Schur, where already we have someone who has said he wants to answer to this question. And then please, uh, Lena Gustafsson and Thomas Aspect, be prepared to get live. Um, let me first find the question by Dries Jores Klaas. And it's quite a um, strong question. So what is actually wrong with biodiversity in managed forest? Can Managed forests be managed in a way that they contribute to the biodiversity that meets more goals than this no management. I think this is a question where I look forward to who will want to respond. And then the next uh, question is a longer one by Christoph, where I really want, uh, by Christoph Sure, I need to find it again, where I have already noted down that, um, uh, that Jakob wants to respond to it. So as Christoph says, in the 21st century, there will probably be a traumatic and unpredictable evolution of forest ecosystems. And this will be a great challenge for any criteria of selection of set aside areas as well as to protect the ecosystems themselves. So our policy actors and stakeholders, they may want to reverse and change their decisions even on the short run. Are you somehow considering these thoughts? What are your ideas towards this question? I think also addressing climate change and, and changes in the overall society and economy. Well, um, the trees question, who wants to answer to trees question or statement on this question of the potential of managed forests to uh, protect biodiversity? I see Chris and I see Jakob. And then afterwards, uh, Jakob can just continue on the second question because you already volunteered here. Then. Yeah, maybe I, I will have a quick answer first. I think there's nothing wrong with biodiversity in managed forests. That's uh, an, an important goal. Uh, and as I tried to point out in, our, in my presentation, both segregative and integrative approaches, so having uh, biodiversity in the managed forest and also setting aside parts of the forest as a, as a strict reserve, are complementary. Uh, some things cannot be reached in unmanaged forest, and some, some other species will not thrive in a, in, a, in a managed forest. So uh, it's a combination of both that will make sure that you keep uh, your full biodiversity. And there's some statements that say that the more you invest in integrative management, the less strict reserves you may need. Uh, that's uh, something to discuss, of course. And the, the, the share of unmanaged forests will mostly depend on, on a political, politi political decision rather than a scientific uh, decision, I think. Thank you. Uh, Jakob? Yes, I have little to add to, to, to the first question, uh, what Chris said. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with biodiversity in managed forests. And since most of our forests are managed and, and will be, will be con be, be continue to be managed, I think there's no risk that we will lose species due to the design of, of some reserves. That's important to put in mind. Uh, so, so, so what we should design reserves for are, are those species that are really, really difficult to, to, to handle in the managed stands. Uh, but, and then transferring to the second question, what about planning in uncertainty in relation to, to climate change? I think I would say that um, it's an important question, but, uh, but the answer is relatively simple because uh, if we should still do the same. I mean, 
to 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 have areas where nature can develop by its own means and have these areas carefully selected by some of the criteria that Eric presented that you work to to conserve complementarity so that you you based on the natural history of your country both those that are affected by humans and those that are not so that those that are related to climatic gradient to to gradients in soil conditions and so on they are creating the 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 complementary patterns of biodiversity and, and these should be prioritized in a, in a good network so we have the sandy soils and the high alkaline soils and, and all the different habitats in the network and then it's just I would say a matter of uh, of letting go and, and, and it's not the first time in evolutionary history we have climate change so probably most of the species will have no problems in moving with the climate uh, especially not if we create connectivity in the landscape. And that's where also like the managed forest, if they are managed in a way that, that they that allow transfer of species by having small set asides, by having some uh, areas with higher conservation value, then they can allow the species to move. And then of course, there might be certain species of high interest that are not able to move but we don't know yet of course we can make models to 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 try to identify them but we will only show when the climate really starts to affect the 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 the, the, the biodiversity uh, and then we we might consider like having uh, having a translocation of these species but at the moment the most prominent threats to forest biodiversity are the lack of habitats that are in, in a natural condition. So that's the first part is a place to start and, and there's nothing new with climate change. You could even say that there's only a demand for larger areas that are developing in a natural way that allows all these habitats to be there for the species. Thanks a lot, uh, Jakob. And now let's uh, turn to the north of Europe. I see Lena already there, probably in Sweden. Um, and she has a Swedish perspective question for the Danish colleagues. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much for the nice presentations. And uh, my question is about uh, the multi-scale approach. And uh, the small areas are imp is an important part of the multi-scale approach. But it seems to me, after Chris uh, told us that uh, small in his context is 20 to 200 hectares, uh, I I believe, I think that uh, the definition of small varies a lot across Europe. So I would like uh, from the Danish colleagues, if you could please uh, give your view on what you consider to be small areas. Yeah, yes, um, I guess that's uh, not a question we really are working very much on because we are using multi-scales from, from the single tree level uh, through uh, of one half to one or two hectare stands, which we protected already in the 1990s if they were old growth, more than 160 year old native tree uh, areas in our state forest. We had a, uh, since the 90s protected those at stand level. So we have tree level and stand level and the new process here in the last uh, 10 years uh, or five years maybe has been to say, okay, we have the tree level, we have the stand level, we will be even making more habitat trees protecting uh, between five and 10 habitat trees per hectare in the state forest and in the FSC uh, certification schemes. But we, in the new political decisions where we need many thousands of hectares of new uh, forest reserves, there it has been said, okay, we, we want to designate whole forests, the, regardless of the size of the forest, if it's less than 200 hectares, if the species process and the uh, researchers recommendations say this forest is relevant for protection, then we will take the whole forest, regardless of size, if it's less than 200 hectares. While if it's a larger forest uh, area with maybe 2,000 or 5,000 hectares of forest as in our largest forest comp compounds, then we say, if depending on where the map species concentrations or the proxies uh, show that there is a good habitat for species, we will select um, the, the, the most relevant areas for the most relevant type of protection. So we're not deciding on what is small or big, we are using all scales. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we move a bit to the south. Uh, Thomas Aspect from University of Freiburg. Thomas, are you visible? Are you there? Yes, I hope so. Can you hear me? I'll read your question again and uh, might address the scientists, but also ourselves here. That's <laughs> happy. Thomas, go ahead. So, um, thank you very much for the presentations. I really enjoyed this uh, morning. Also, I think there was quite a consensus on uh, that we need managed forests and how to implement certain measures. So I think that was very nice to see from my perspective. So now I want to raise a little bit a critical issue that we have currently, for instance, in Germany, but it might also occur in other um, countries where we have the, the case that due, due to this uh, rising awareness of the public, um, the dead trees, dead spruces in the forest are very visible for everybody, no matter if he's a scientist or a practitioner. And so there's a lot of media uh, attention, relatively a lot for our field. And um, so I don't want to go into the classic nature conservation versus politics versus practitioners versus science um, discussion, because I think we also had some information about stakeholders already. But my question is um, specifically when you have scientists arguing um, what we heard today f um, for a complete uh, nature conservation because of the rising uh, disturbances who are actually scientists or come from a scientific background, but engage very actively that you might consider they are already developing into a sort of more lobbyist um, way and how to deal with that from a scientific perspective because uh, you, you are kind of forced to take sides and as a scientist you prefer to be in between chairs and not uh, to strongly uh, select a side. And I was wondering also particularly asking the Ify in Bonn who is working at this policy science interface and also engaging in, in this public discussions and also there are some practitioners here or people who are a little bit more from the um, practitioner side. Um, how to deal with that if scientists um, change during debates their role and start more or less arguing in a lobbyist way and uh, how to react to that and if we should also engage that actively in uh, public discussions. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I just wonder you interest us, so probably I give it a try. I give you three sentences and then I ask all the colleagues that are very experienced in that a question uh, as well. So the, the question is basically asking what is the role of scientists in these debates? And, and I would clearly think that scientists need to engage, they need to offer their knowledge, but also they need to be clear in my view about the limits of their knowledge. Because we cannot know everything and there are many limitations and we've seen it in the presentations, there are specific cases, things we know and others we don't know. Um, I think it's up to each scientist to decide uh, in my view how far they want to go. But for me, what is the key that we remain with in things where there's evidence uh, that we are reporting about that, which is not easy. And sometimes I have the feeling that colleagues from other disciplines and other viewpoints help us to control this, because then they say back, well, how do you know this? And, and why did you make a statement? So my response would be, yes, I think scientists need to engage clearly. There's, this is why they exist. They need to offer knowledge to society, but they need to ask themselves quite often, is this still something where we have research evidence on, or does this go on? So now colleagues have time to prepare themselves. Do you want to comment also to this? And give Thomas also advice for his further career, I think, at the University of Freiburg, how to behave. Jakob? Yes, I, I'm not sure I can say too much, on, except that I really know what you're talking about, and it's a tricky issue. And I think as scientists, we should really try to be true to the kind of political decisions. That's what we need to, well, when we are dealing with conservation biology, we should, we, we should, uh, we should answer how can you, what is the, how are different treatments working for biodiversity? That, that's what, as a, as a conservation scientist, I have to work with. And, and then, of course, uh, when you see, and, and it's, it's, you should always try not to be a lobbyist, even though everybody working with conservation science are very happy with biodiversity, but, but we should still only address how is this affecting the goal. Uh, and it, uh, of course the same should apply for foresters. And I think it applies for most forest scientists that they are really dealing with how can we optimize 
the goal of timber production. I think the problem is probably that there's too little interdisciplinary research where we really try to 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 look at things in combination. And, and I think that's uh, that's fueling many of these discussions. But I mean, and then there's of course the the ability to go into the the scientific debate and 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 criticize studies that are putting things too far by by neglecting that biodiversity for instance should be measured in the right way thank you uh, quick response also by eric and then we should move on to the next questions yes i i think it's very important that researchers do uh, go into the public debate and policy to help uh, both the politicians the people and the agencies to make the right decisions because the scientists do have a lot of knowledge and I agree totally with Jacob that then we need to also refer to the political agreements. But one of the ways we in our agency have tackled uh, this kind of issue is that when we have like 10, 15 different researchers saying different things, they're not always in agreement and how to manage the sites we have designated, then we have tried to pay a few, uh, not too high funding, but to make the scientists try to make some kind of re consensus report, try to agree on where are their agreements? What should we do as the best type of management? So, so that we, out of the jungle of, of, of discussions, can sort of grasp what is the, the main thing where the scientists agree. So, so I don't think the scientists should choose uh, one side or the other, but they should try to uh, join forces to, to make mutual uh, consensus agreements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to soon give the floor to Renzo Motta. Um, but before that, um, please stay with me because my colleague Jakob, another Jakob in the room, he asked a really interesting question about this question of set aside regarding this election of forest reserves. So Jakob, please okay. come over and move away you. and read your question. Yeah, I actually had uh, two questions, but now I will I will stick to the second one that I just um, wrote in the chat. Um, when you select spaces to set aside, and we had the same discussion when selecting for all the countries face this issue when selecting sites uh, for the Natura 2000 network, you often choose the sites that have already been managed well in the past. So how do you prevent forest managers that have done good management how do you prevent from punishing them from, for the management that they've conducted in the past decades? Because somebody who has just done clear cut and spruce plantations for 50 years, his site will never be set aside, so he can just continue what he's doing. Um, so, and and I, is there a threat that this might counteract integrated forest management? Because if a manager makes decisions that benefit biodiversity conservation, he may run the risk of losing control of his management. Thank you. Oh, it's a difficult question. Uh, are you addressing someone specifically? The Danish people. The Danish. I have I have more questions about the Danish approach. It's a very interesting one, uh, but very peculiar as well. So the Danish people. Uh, I don't know whom of the Danish people wants to respond to that. Eric's already there. Eric. Uh, okay, I'll try. Uh, well, I don't recall in Denmark that anybody in the state forestry department at least has taken it as a punishment because we usually, well, we have a strong tradition for a de democratic, it's the people's uh, forest and most of the public, they really love the forest and the species and they're, they, they uh, I, I have not met this problem in reality and perhaps in the private forestry sector it might be, but it, but, but I'm not even sure that most, most foresters I know, they love the nature, they love the species. And if you have good clear cut goals and the economy to do things, uh, I, I don't see this as a punishment, but there might be other cases in other countries. I'm not sure. Thank you. Yeah. 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 No, no. <laughs> you can call him afterwards. Okay. <laughs> We have too many other things. Thank you. Anyone else wants to comment on that? Uh, if not, uh, I had to stop uh, Jakob here, um, but he will call you probably afterwards. Um, I have now where well, he had disappeared. Renzo Motta, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Oh, thank you to everyone for the very interesting seminar. Uh, as uh, most of uh, participants has already mentioned, uh, we have different perspectives uh, depending on the country and the environment where we live. But uh, one, uh, I think, important issue is that uh, most of our forests, the European forests, have been heavily managed in the past and now are outside the natural range of uh, variability that you can find in natural forest. Uh, in Italy, most of the forest in the past uh, have been coppiced. I think 60% of the forest have been coppiced. And uh, even if uh, uh, we have native species, uh, these uh, forests have been uh, strongly modified structurally by human and are now are outside the natural range of management. So if we simply create gaps in these forests. We cannot restore the previous uh, native biodiversity. We create a new uh, biodiversity. I, I don't uh, want to say that it is bad or good, but uh, um, in the communication, in the approach that we have with the stakeholder, we have to be uh, clear. Uh, otherwise, uh, people think that uh, simply we stop uh, to cut uh, uh, the forest and uh, immediately or in a very short time we have an uh, old growth forest. But uh, uh, not always uh, is a good thing uh, to abandon the forest management because uh, if we have uh, uh, some artificial forest uh, uh, simply stopping to cut the tree and create problems, then the, uh, there is a problem in providing ecosystem services and so on. And the second thing that is important to discuss is that uh, uh, we have to take into account uh, also the uh, disturbance regime. So if we create gaps, uh, we have to take into account that uh, natural uh, disturbance regimes is uh, wind or it is uh, fire. Uh, the, the gaps are large or small in nature and uh, um, in order to um, mimic the natural disturbances and not to create something that in nature uh, doesn't exist. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Renzo. Who wants to respond to this uh, questions? So Eric has been really warming up. Eric. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think we totally agree that there are many objectives and many different uh, issues and the past is one of them and the disturbance regime. So I think when we are working at multi-scales, uh, the gaps will be at the medium scale while the more rewilding approach will be at the large scale where we're talking many hundreds of hectares or even thousands of hectares. We uh, are really working very hard in Denmark to restore also the natural dynamics. And that goes for the hydrology, that goes for, for the reinstating uh, uh, disturbance regime of grazing. Uh, I think it was Jakob who mentioned the large grazers, which have be, been exterminated in Denmark. And we don't want overgrazing. We, we are working very hard to find out what would be a natural disturbance regime, what would be a naturalistic grazing regime with not too many and not too few grazers. So I think windstorms, grazers, hydrology, and sometimes fire, especially in, in the south of Europe, will be uh, a very important disturbance regimes which we have to apply. And that will be mainly possible in the large scale set aside reserves because in the forestry, uh, the pest outbreaks and, and everything else that comes from the storms and the droughts, that, that can be a bigger problem. So we have to take care of that in the, in the integration of the forestry areas because we also have climate, we also have wood production as objectives. So we need to balance the objectives in general. Thank you, Eric. And thank you also Renzo for asking the question. Um, I have another question that is again expressing uh, Eric. So before I take this question by Christoph Dürr, and he will be live from Switzerland, I would like to put an own question that's not addressing Eric explicitly, unless he really wants to. 
um, that goes and through my mind since some minutes by Christopher Stefan getting live. My question is a bit, um, as someone who worked a lot also on these social questions relating to force management, I would like to know how important are the different biodiversity criteria that you have been mentioning for the selection of a strict protected reserves in comparison to societal socioeconomic factors, or to be more explicit, how important is now in the Danish and in the Belgian situation also societal context, for instance, that a city wants a certain forest to be protected or not protected, or vice versa, that in a rural landscape, we had some cases in Germany, people were heavily against the strict protection status of a forest. How important is this in decision making? How natural science based are the selection? Is the selection in the end, it would be really interesting for me to learn your experiences in, in Flanders and in Denmark. And perhaps I'm addressing Max, uh, that Eric has a bit uh, time to have a coffee before he will be addressed by this with colleague. Chris, Mats, what do you, can you say on this? Chris. Oh, and there's Mats. Mats. <laughs> so, and there are both. Now, who wants to go first? Go ahead, Mats. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, it's a highly relevant question at the moment. Tonight, our minister is, is uh, meeting a lot of, uh, of local people different places in Denmark exactly to discuss this question. When, uh, when dealing with, uh, with these numbers of, on the, of uh, segregation forests, um, we are approaching this from a highly uh, scientific uh, point of view. With people like Eric and Jacob and some of their colleagues, we are asking them and talking to them what would be the a perfect forest to, uh, to uh, do on such. And doing that, we uh, in the second hand discuss uh, this situation with the local people to try to, to uh, get them to realize that they can still uh, fulfill most of their, uh, of their needs. Um, and I think we will succeed in many ways, but there also will be uh, uh, some time where we need to uh, say to people, you need to go to the, to the forest uh, next by. This is a very tricky situation, but first and foremost, we need to, to discuss with people, invite people, get people to know and understand why we are doing the things we are doing. If I could come back just to a little question that Daniel uh, asked further uh, 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 early on, he was asking about how uh, how do we secure that uh, that the uh, people don't get um, unsatisfied of uh, discussions and and uh, feel that their work wasn't uh, worth anything. Um, I think it's very important when finding the the forests. We need to be on a scientific uh, base. We need to let people know there is a reason for taking out this forest and it should be this forest exactly. We need to talk to the pride of, of these people. The reason for this forest to be interesting, interesting is that you have been working with it for the last 30 years as you have, as you have been doing. When doing so, I think we can go quite far Secondly, we have to respect and have everyone in the debate to respect that there's all uh, other interests than their own. And we, in doing so, we need to get everyone to prioritize uh, their, um, their needs. Um, if we can get into a situation where we can have a, a fruitful discussion and uh, Jacob, for instance, uh, representing the, the biologists can say, it needs to be this forest. We, we can do this, but this is the most important to do. We, we have a, a, a space of, uh, of working with things. And thirdly, of course, uh, the funding of, uh, of these aspects is, is quite important as well. If the funding is there, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to get uh, people to think it's a good idea. Thank you, Max. Uh, Chris? Well, I have very little to add to this because uh, the way we go forward in, in, in Belgium is very comparable. We, we try to work together with, uh, with the forest owners and the forest managers 
and and uh, come to reasonable uh, proposals that they they feel good with. Uh, I I don't recall any situations where the where the forest manager was really against or opposing. Sometimes it needs some discussion. It needs some. Uh, some negotiation, but finally we mostly or always had a had a good solution. Also, for private owners, there's a possibility to 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 propose their sites, and they are financially compensated for that. But that's not obligatory. So uh, I think the problems start when you start to impose uh, certain things uh, above the heads of people and not involve them in it. Uh, then, then you will get can get into trouble. But, but up to now, we didn't have any problems there. Either. Thank you. Um, then I have three last quick questions, Christoph. We will put you live, uh, live from Switzerland, and then I will read two more, and then we have to close for today. Christoph, good morning or good afternoon. Good noon. <laughs> okay. Good noon. Hello, Georg. Hello. Oh, yes, I can hear you. Oh, we can hear you properly. Okay, very good. Uh, I just had the question to Eric about this 30% target, which is now uh, uh, discussed in, in CBD, but uh, as I understand also in the, in the Green Deal, in the EU biodiversity strategy. Is this something uh, you consider also when when uh, selecting the sites and when uh, writing all these criteria, which one should include it and in which sense, and how do you split that then in, in real protection, I mean in, in full protection or in managed protection? Do you have a, a separation of these terms also in your considerations? Thank you very much. Yes. Well, well, thank you. Um, it's very complex, this 30% issue, because there's, there is a, it includes, as in my opinion, a very long range of different uh, uh, standards of protection. So some uh, protection types included in the 30%, if you're unlucky, it's only a, a thing on the map and, uh, or a name on the map. Uh, while we are uh, we have very, very many different types of protection and using the IUCN uh, system for reporting, but in, in a national scale, we have a huge number of different designation types of, of different levels of, of protection. So I, I think for the forest protection and the integration approach, we're not really uh, looking very carefully at the 30% because the 30% objective will be using all other kinds of protection at the landscape level and mature 2000 sites. Thank you, Eric. Like to last questions, we won't make them live because we are running a bit out of time. The first one is just a comment by Eckert Zell. It's a, um, I know Eckert, so he's a private forest owner in, in Austria, but also very active in representing for Silver Europe. And he's just highlighting that the question from Jakob Dax, my colleague here in the room, is a key question in the context of this trust of forest managers and private owners to be integrated for. So I think what he wants to state is this risk, let's put it like that, that something that's strictly protected might be a key from his perspective, at least then referring to private lands, but perhaps also beyond. And then I have a question by Katrin Han Han. Christensen, obviously I would think Danish is my limited knowledge about the languages in Europe. She's just asking, should we manage for individual threatened species or aim to create habitats? I will use this as your final, final question and I see Jakob already wants to respond. And Eric. Jakob. Yes, uh, addressing the last question, uh, I, I, yes, as a, the problem with forest biodiversity is it's so large, there's so many species, so, so in almost all cases, it's not a good idea to manage for, for individual species unless it's like uh, the one species you have on your, your national flag or something like that. Uh, it, it's simply cherry picking out of a, a, a real large uh, uh, set of species. So it, it very rarely makes sense unless you really select umbrella species that are covering a whole groups of fungi. So, so that's why it, it's 
in practice, the way forward is to, to manage for the critical habitats and, and the natural processes that are allowing forest biodiversity to be fully developed. Thank you. And then Eric, do you want to complement? Yes, I would just say we use the, the, the species as a conglomerate. We, we collect species data for many species and if they have overlapping, overlapping habitat requirements and preferences, that is the way to point out that in this area you really need something for the open land or forest blade species and in other forests uh, that you have relic species liking the shadowy conditions of the untouched forest. So we are using the, the species to, to provide information on which kind of protection or management would be good, but we're not managing the single species. Thank you. Uh, before now closing this, I would like to do again uh, the same poll we did in the very beginning with our three big strategies on what to do moving towards uh, strictly protected forests in the case. Jose, can you show the poll again? And let's see if we have some changes in the opinions and standpoints of the participants of the webinar. So you have seen already the question in the beginning, what is the best way to transfer a wood production forest into a known intervention natural forest? Um, do nothing. Nature will find its way in any case, actively manage for ecological restoration to speed up the process. It depends on the situation. 10 seconds, make your choice. And then we will compare the initial result with this result. And then we can think about what this means, what we see there. How many do we have possible? 50%. Okay, five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. I think it's exactly, <laughs> is this the last or is this? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, now can you somehow move it that we can see both? <laughs> so basically, um, I think uh, what we can see here is that uh, basically it's very similar to last time, but it depends who has been growing, which is probably always the case when you had different scientific uh, presentations that show the complexity of the issue. Um, well, and otherwise, I think the shares are very similar to the start. So, nevertheless, I hope that you found this interesting, that you have learned something, even though you didn't change your big uh, orientation. Uh, for me, I have to say that was very interesting. I learned a lot. Um, and I would like to close this by thanking a big group of people. So, first of all, really our speakers who did an excellent job. I again want to really highlight Chris, who merged two presentations in the early morning. Great, thank you but really excellent insights into the science of transferring managed forests to non-managed forests. But also um, Mats and the Danish colleagues for presenting a bit the Danish situation, which we unfortunately couldn't move live in the forest. Perhaps in 20 years, if Integrate still exists, we will, there will be a second chance to go to Denmark, but probably we are not the ones then that will go in the forest then uh, anymore. I would also really like to thank, um, in a broader context, the Danish Nature Agency, Especially also Mons and Mats for um, organ for being the chair of the Integrate Network at this time and helping us in organizing this webinar, and the German VML for funding the project that is currently helping to facilitate all the discussion process we are doing in Integrate. And finally, no, not finally, second finally, all my colleagues here in the room, thanks for helping a lot. You haven't been visible at all. Do you want to gather behind me? that someone can see how many people are actually here in Bonn trying to help me understanding what I'm doing. Uh, while they are showing themselves, um, I would like to really thank all of the participants uh, for joining this on a Monday morning. I hope it was helpful. We tackled some questions. You might have other questions coming up. This will be, has been recorded and will be available for you in case you think this was interesting, but I want to hear this again because I'm not sure if I fully got what was said there. Thank you very much. Have a great week and hope to see you again in one or the other Integrate event. I see someone whispers here. Second part. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. Mats, do you want to say a last word from Danish side? It has been a pleasure joining this, uh, Geo, and thank you for, uh, for facilitating this, uh, this debate. Uh, I was wondering whether an hour for discussion was too much or too little. 
I think it was uh, perfect with all these good uh, questions and good answers. Uh, I feel that uh, many of the participants uh, go around the, the case of working together, different kind of uh, scientists, different kind of stakeholders. And in a Danish point of view, at least, this is very, very important to gain as much out of the forest that uh, the society uh, asks for. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us and um, see you once again somewhere. Thank you.